into a human I can depend on to bring me happy. Welcome to a Captain's Log. I'm Brian Kreutz, and here with me is my esteemed co-host, Lily Fox Loom. Oh, thank you, Brian. Lily? David Zappone was really giving us some great insider info on the Voyager documentary and all that we have to look forward to. Coming soon to a view screen near you is the Star Trek Voyager documentary called To the Journey, looking back at Star Trek Voyager. In case you missed it, last week we interviewed David Zappone. On this episode, we continue that interview here on a Captain's Log. So I'm sure it will also include a few new 4K clean footage space battles that will look pristine, like the Dominion War uh, remastered for the Deep Space Nine documentary. Yes, Voyager's momentous return to Earth with the ship flying through fireworks to San Francisco Bay would be so nice. Not to mention 4K remastered footage of the Borg Unicomplex and the Borg Transwarp Hub used in the final episode. Wow. <laughs> I like that vast Borg Unicomplex story from Voyager's finale. It connected structures and hubs spanning across vast space, housing hundreds of Borg cubes. We have a lot of questions, and spoilers if there are any, that David Zappone will give in our interview coming up on a Captain's Log. Computer. What's Raj's location on the Oris? Roger Corby Jr. is located in engineering at Jeffrey's Tube Junction 25 and is not near a communication capable location. Roger here, Bass! I don't, I don't know, know if you can, can hear me. me. Didn't, Didn't you get my automated response beacon when you asked the, the computer my whereabouts on the ship? ship? Are you there? Uh, Roger! <laughs> I'm in engineering, even lower than the lower decks personnel will ever have to go for deuterium injection subsystem maintenance. Raj, we'll talk to you a little bit later after the interview. Computer, close channel. Oh, the second part of your interview with David Zappone? I have to watch. I have to. Don't want to miss it. Is that now? I must complete my work here so I can watch. Bass, wait, can you hear me? Or did I lose the comm channel? Bass! Bass! Computer, reestablish! Computer, reestablish communications! We're interviewing David Zappone, and now we're discussing the upcoming documentary officially titled To the Journey, looking back at Star Trek Voyager. Your documentaries have premiered at a variety of places in the past. For the Love of Spock premiered in 2016 at the Tribeca Film Festival, and most recently, What We Left Behind, the Star Trek Deep Space Nine documentary premiered in theaters via Fathom Events for one day only. So, besides these special screenings, of course, can we expect a film festival release or, say, a theatrical release for us fans on this Voyager documentary? David? You know, I don't know yet. Um, it really depends on timing, number one, because I'd only want this in one of the bigger uh, film festivals, probably a South by Southwest might be a good home for it. Tribeca, it's Spock did very well, but I never felt it was quite the right audience for a Star Trek film. It just seems like that Tribeca slate didn't really mesh with ours. So, what I really liked, I thought the Fathom idea was excellent. Yeah. So were Fathom involved, uh, interested again, and I think they already have expressed interest, quite frankly. See, my, my, I have a good problem when it comes to distribution. Very often you're out searching for a distributor. So you go the festival route. Mm -hmm. I usually have a distributor already because they know it's Star Trek. We're proven. So then it's a matter of do you want to do like with Spock? We had it sold. We, they just agreed, uh, a company named Gravitas distributed Spock. They agreed to let us release a Tribeca because it's good, good word of mouth. It's good advertising. But no, I think the best way to get the largest amount of fans to see with reasonable marketing costs, now with the internet, the word gets out there. You don't need marquees and signs on buses. Uh, we do it probably the Fathom, one night, one night only. And hey, if it does really well, maybe we'll do two nights. That'd be great. And it did really well last time, you know. Yeah, I, we were surprised we were there. Doing two, actually. Yeah. It will be so nice 
to see those really, really talented recurring characters and actors speaking their perspective on this Voyager documentary. Of course, we know the lead actors will knock it out of the ballpark with their stories in Picard, Mulger, Wong, Duncan McNeil, Beltran, Russ, Ryan, and Dawson, but can you tell us about any other actors who are interviewed, like Martha Hackett, who played the amazing Seska? Uh, Jennifer Lean has some um, health issues, so we're not sure, okay. uh, which is well known. Uh, however, Martha Hackett has already been in. But we're going so deep that we're even interviewing a few of the alternate bridge crew who die in the pilot. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, the first ops a guy named Scott McDonald is a wonderful actor. He came in. Mm -hmm. But what he gave us was, first of all, what a bummer. You know, you get killed off in the pilot and show that's going to go for seven years. <laughs> and I believe he's, he was replaced in operations by Harry Kim. Mm -hmm. But um, great actor. But he gave us insight into working one of the few people to work with Jean Vieve Bougeau. Oh, yeah. So the first captain. Able to, able to get that because that's another interesting part of the Voyager story. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that footage ex exists. Everybody's seen it. It's on the DVDs. We will make an effort to get her. I don't know if she'd be interested in speaking with us, but it doesn't hurt to ask. That'd be an interesting interview to see, um, you know, her take and actually hear it from her mouth, you know, yeah. why things went different. But yeah, that, that's a great I have to recommend highly, again, this is not blatant commercialism. It's only in the captain's uh, and the captain's close up because the captain's was a 90 minute feature. And what Bill and I said to Epics at the time was we, we did because he's such an incredible interviewer. We had so much footage that he said, what if we took five episodes and did one each about each captain? So what the captain's collection includes are five additional episodes focused primarily. So if you. If you want an insight into Voyager, watch the Kate Mulgrew episode on the captain's close-up. She told me it was one of the best interviews ever done on her life. If really? Not yeah. As did Patrick Stewart, as did, as did Avery Brooks, and Scott Bakula was very happy as well. Janeway out. Star Trek captains have to be on it right away. Because so often the camera's with us and we have to hit these unspeakable marks. <laughs> Green screens, blue screens, <laughs> and non-existent aliens spouting this language and setting the tone for the rest of our company. And mine were, I had nine in my cast. And people think that we're having these lovely breaks, don't they, Bill? And being brought coffee. You've got to be strong. So I think when they were looking at us, certainly Patrick and me, Avery, they were thinking, constitutionally, is she up to it? Then, can she speak the language? Which is, it might as well be Shakespeare. It's so highly stylized. To be able to spin that language out and make it accessible to the audience at large is a, is a gift not a lot of actors have. And I did it. So I'm very proud of that. And so was I. Many of our fans' favorite standalone non-two-part episodes is timeless. I have to remind viewers briefly of the contents of this awesome episode, since Voyager sometimes didn't get all next Jenny or Picardly philosophical with their episode titles to make them stand out. Timeless was the episode that Voyager crash-landed on an ice world, resulting in the deaths of the entire Voyager crew except Chakotay and Harry Kim, who try to alter history to have the sh save the ship from disaster. Yes, Captain Geordi LaForge appears in this episode on a Galaxy-class ship, and LeVar also directed it. You see, Doc, 15 years ago, I miscalculated the slipstream threshold transmitted the wrong phase corrections to Voyager. Boom. They were knocked out of the slipstream and sent to an icy death. We're going to send Voyager a new set of phase corrections. At least you weren't buried under 20 meters of ice. You don't know how many times I wished I was. Altering the timeline may make things worse. At least you and Chakotay survived. Why tend to fate? This timeline only exists because I made a mistake 15 years ago. The crew trusted in me and I let them down. I know it's a risk. 
probably our biggest one yet. But I'm willing to take it. Are you with me? Always. Long-range sensors are picking up a Federation vessel. How much time do we have? I entered a low orbit and remodulated our shields, but it won't be long before they find us. Six hours if we're lucky. Starfleet's on an intercept course. It's now or never. We know what you're about to attempt, and we can't let that happen. Put me on that shuttle. I'll get Voyager through the substrate. It took me ten years to make these corrections. I can't fix it in three minutes! You've got to try! You can't just give up. 23 simulations, 23 catastrophes. Did you see? History is repeating itself! I destroyed Voyager once, and I'm doing it again! The slipstream's destabilizing. Shut down the drive. What are you saying? We've got to find them! It's... There's no choice. So, David, Garrett Wong and CGI guy Robert Bonchun have both stated that they mildly regret that the episode Timeless was not a two-parter. Does the documentary bring up any questions like this about what-ifs with some of our favorite episodes? For example, what if this was a two-parter? Or what did a Voyager actor or producer really want to happen in an episode? Like, are there any story ideas that we never got to see? So David, my question is, what can you tell us about this, maybe a spoiler or two, that doesn't give too much away? That inside information might come from additional discussions with Bran and Braga or Ken Biller. That would probably come from the showrunners themselves. So we're still interviewing all those guys. We've already interviewed Bran twice and Rick Berman too, uh, and Jerry Taylor. So we've gotten a good number of the showrunners. But yeah, that's the kind of thing we could ask the showrunners for sure. That'd be amazing. Yeah. yeah. These are our fans' the favorite episodes. So the actors probably won't, won't mm -hmm. recall. Yeah. So, David, uh, I know one of the great things about documentaries is we get to hear and see people interviewed that are behind the scenes that we normally are, you know, looking at other people on the other side of the camera as actors. So, are there any special folks in this documentary that you can maybe share with us as a spoiler that are behind the scenes? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're gonna probably do the same thing we did last time. We have a couple of guys in Germany named David and Christian who are practically, they could have worked on the show. They helped us recreate Sacrifice of Angels for uh, what we left behind. All that CGI had to be redone and it's amazing. So they'll be helping. Doug Drexler, uh, I'm sure will be helping. The Okudas will be helping. We just talked to Rick Sternbach. Uh, Dan Curry is going to be helping. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, Dennis McCarthy, my favorite person, one of my favorite people from Star Trek. Love this guy. He will be back to do our score because he scored over 60 episodes of Voyager. So, uh, I've got Jonathan West as our DP. As we said earlier, Chris Frosco was our camera operator. Uh, Karen Westerfield, who was Armin Shimmerman's Emmy-winning makeup artist, just did our makeup for us on the Voyager shoot. So I try to populate it with as much of the original Star Trek people as I can. And I think it gives it a, a level of authenticity. And I think pe they feel very comfortable when they're sitting down to be interviewed, looking into Jonathan West's camera you know, uh, someone that they'd seen and been so close to for so many years and trust. So, yeah, I think we're, we really, this time more than the other ones, have a very Star Trek heavy uh, crew. It's amazing. Yeah. All those names are all star names um, as crew. Awesome. And, well, and Lolita Facho is doing the, uh, asking the questions. I mean, who knows these people better than Lolita? Mm -hmm. A captain's log with special guest David Zaprun returns in a moment. If you're just tuning in, David Zapone, the talented producer and director, is with us here on a captain's log. Now, just like in your Deep Space Nine documentary, we know you're hard at work at replacing lots of minutes of new HD sequences for this Voyager documentary, and I'm sure it takes months of work from the CBS Digital team to coordinate that. I would like to ask, will there be footage from behind the scenes or even deleted scenes from the cuts that we've never seen on the DVDs? Not a lot was saved, unfortunately. And the problem when we went back and found the um, uh, 35 millimeter, which we up for Deep Space Nine, you know, the big film rolls, mm -hmm. um, the problem is those are not married to sound. 
So very often you can scan a blooper, let's say, or, or a deleted scene, but it's almost impossible to find the separate mag track, mm -hmm. the sound. So it's a prodigious. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's definitely difficult. I mean, these, all of these assets exist in a salt mine somewhere back east. Yeah. That answers uh, another one of my questions, then. I won't even have to ask that one. I always wondered why it was so difficult to retrieve that the, the things from the cans. It's because of the sound, then, to match up. I got gotcha. you. And we had to hire the Okudas just to help us with, like, because the they weren't identified well. Mm -hmm. So we had to hire people to try to decipher their filing system. So it, was, it, it took months. It was difficult. And with yeah. the help of Michael and Denise Okuda, geez, that you just can't yeah. ask for a couple of uh, great people that just love Star Trek, you know, even inventing yeah. the encyclopedia and all that. So, David, as producers, how do you prioritize the non-actors or crew as who will get to be interviewed or have a speaking part in this documentary? If decided, is it simply because they were well-spoken about their time on Voyager, or is it because you know that they have an interesting story to tell in the documentary that maybe we've never heard before? Mm. Uh, it's more, I try not to judge people based on how well-spoken they are. Um, you know, you give everybody a chance. It's really, do they have, a, what can they contribute to the story? I mean, just to show you how deep we went, we interviewed a guy here at Paramount. His name is Aaron Siegel, and he's known as the unofficial mayor of Paramount. And uh, he basically runs the commissary. And he's been here for 20 something years, 26 years. He started as a PA on Voyager, but he got fired. And he just proceeds to tell us this hilarious story of all the name, Mary Howard, all these names you've heard, heard, and what really went on behind the scenes at Paramount, why he got fired, and how they became friends later. And then it turned out he was the subject of the blooper reel, which we're trying to get. So anyway, yeah, we're no stone unturned uh, is our attitude here. That's so cool. Man. Mm -hmm. Anyways, will we get to see this Canadian-born CGI expert Rob Bonchoon or maybe any other special behind-the-scenes folks in this documentary, David? Berman had been told to kind of keep Roddenberry's vision in line to where you don't deviate too much from his original vision. Are there, are there those type of stories or those type of themes of stories where uh, Voyager's coming out now with the first female captain and all this kind of stuff. Are those type of stories told in this as well uh, from the creator's perspective? Because you said you got an interview with Jerry Taylor. That's a good question. Yeah. Right. Uh, obviously the only person. And we even got a very moving interview with uh, Sean Pillar, Michael Pillar's son, um, who was old enough to remember all of the creation of the show. So Pillar is represented, which is great. Um, yeah, I think, um, clearly the legacy is the fact that it was the first female captain. And what we did also do, which I don't think has been done before, we interviewed a whole slew of Paramount executives. And, uh, you can remember this was a flagship show for a brand new network, UPN. A lot of people don't remember that. I forgot about that. Yeah. So, so we, we're going to talk to the strongest uh, woman executive at the time, Lucy Salhani, who's responsible for this. So we're going to even get that perspective on the network uh, side and studio side. So, yes, I think we're going very deep into how this did or didn't fit into Roddenberry's vision. People have differing opinions about that. But that will be explored in the documentary. Awesome. Looking forward to that. It's really cool to see those stories, you know, from beginning to end where yeah. someone's like so low and now you're an Emmy Award winner for so what inspiring. you're doing. Yeah, it really is. What's great is Bill and I started together in 2006. I was given a ticket to his Hollywood charity horse show and I'd never met him. And we met and it turns out that it's somebody that was investing. I was with another film company at the time was investing in our movie, Herb William Shatner said, hey, I'll donate a luxury vacation to his uh, charity. Great. So we do it. It sells for like $25,000. And then as a thank you, Bill invited me and my business partner at the time down to the set of Boston Legal to watch him as Denny Crane. And I'll never forget driving down. I said, look, I know enough about Bill Shatner. The minute we meet him, we need to say we have an office on the Paramount lot and we are producers. 
So I said that to Bill Shatner, how are you? I got a project. Like Nadi didn't even miss a beat. So in between Denny Crane courtroom stuff, he's plopping down with us going over this gonzo ballet, which is Ben Folds. I don't know if you recall, did an album in 2004 with Bill called Has Been. And yeah. it was critically acclaimed. It was not the jokey stuff of the 60s. Margot Sappington, a famous choreographer, had the foresight to stage it as a ballet. Bill had the foresight to turn cameras on. So then he said, what do I do with this? So he gave it to our team. We spent a year, re-interviewed him. It became award-winning, Gonzo Ballet. We went to Spain, San Diego, Nashville, went all over the world with this film. And it's really a touching film, and it's on here. And why I bring up that, because this is the only place right now you can get Gonzo Ballet. And that led to The Captains. That led to William Shatner's Get a Life. That led to Chaos on the Bridge. That led to The Captain's Close-Up. That led to Still Kicking, which is an hour-long uh, Chris Plummer and Bill Shatner discussion. And Chris just passed away. Yeah. But this is an amazing full-length. Some of it's in The Captain's, but this is the full-length. And then, uh, I, like I said, Chaos on the Bridge. And then two over two hours of never-before-seen features. So there's a lot of new material on this set and I highly, highly recommend it for Star Trek fans and for William Shatner fans. Ooh, lots of goodies. It's called To The Journey, looking back at Star Trek Voyager. David Zapone, thank you. It's been an honor. I know Lily and I are grateful that you did this interview with us. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you and let's uh, stay in touch. And as Voyager uh, gets closer to completion, I'm sure we can come back on. Yeah, absolutely. We would love that. Really appreciate that. That'd be great. Okay. A captain's log returns in a moment. In our final segment, it's the short story perspective on our planet of the week. Yes, a vacation planet that Raj has chosen for me and the ship's captain approved of for leave. Now let's begin by building suspense with scenarios taken from the canon Star Trek original series episode that perhaps will change your perspective on why the captain of this ship through your eyes, as viewers, should revisit the planet with scenarios on what could happen next. The Enterprise explores a planet. It's like Petals in Wonderland. Where dreams come true. Have you seen a rather large white rabbit? But there's one catch. Are you sure you're not imagining all this? So do the nightmares. They're in trouble. I need every crewman alert and thinking. These things cannot be real. A classic track. What's been happening to my people? <laughs> Star Trek. Ambassador Brian Kreutz, Lieutenant Commander Lily Fox Lim, this is the Captain. I did not want to put this over comms considering Raj's delicate emotional growth. So, here's my recorded message to you on your pad. It's clear that Raj went out of his way to accommodate you for a thoughtful vacation. Well, it's just that. A thought-filling vacation. I'm concerned for you and our crew over this shoreleaf planet. Raj clearly fell for the aggressive, personalized holographic advertisements of Free Cloud and almost booked you for Stardust City, where Admiral Picard has visited before. This amusement planet is more of a vacation for your imagination. Let's look at the scenarios and what the options would be. Do you think it's okay for the caretakers of the planet to enter into your mind to find fantasy or nightmares? Should there be limits to this? I put these questions to you. See you next week. Captain's Log, a request has been made by our android, Raj, to take a shore leave on the amusement planet. Usually, I would not take advice from an ambassador's assistant. However, we had some free time, and I figured we have a crew that overworked themselves, and they could always use some rest. But going to the shore leave planet always leaves me indifferent, as I want to be assured that the caretakers are not taking advantage of their visitors. But the caretakers have the ability to read your mind, and bring to life your best dreams or your worst nightmares. Personally, I think it is intrusive. However, if visitors are fine with the planet being able to penetrate your mind, well, then you are giving them the permission to do so. Or do you fight the urges from the planet? This is tough. 